Uh, welcome everyone to the special Iwo Jima presentation. Thank you for coming today. We have some beautiful weather, even though earlier this morning it was a little bit rainy. So we're very thankful to Sonoma Park for letting us use this beautiful space. Um, before we begin, I always like to ask everybody to silence their cell phones, just in case we don't have any interruptions during the presentation. Um, and just as a note, our Eight Bells lecture series, the next Eight Bells is going to be on March 13th. So I'll send out emails per usual, but I just wanted to bring that up here as well. And that next Eight Bells is going to be the British Battle of the Atlantic, 1939 to 1941. And that's going to be by Naval War College Professor Evan Wilson. Um, today, we are fortunate to be joined by Rodney H. Brown. Rodney Brown is a veteran, a published author in the field of military history, and has assembled important collections in the fields of Caribbean history, African American history, Marine Corps mil military memorabilia. He personally acquired and funded the restoration of the original 10-ton 1945 Iwo Jima Monument, which was on display at the Intrepid Sea Air Space Museum. In 2004, Brown was made the honorary New York City Marine for his rescue, restoration, and exhibition of the monument. His presentation for the 60-year anniversary of the Battle of Iwo Jima, entitled The Meaning of Iwo Jima, was aired on several TV networks. Brown is also the president and founder of the War Museum and the Museum of the Caribbean. Brown holds a bachelor's and master's degree from Trinity College and Juris Doctor from Columbia Law School. He is also a frequent lecturer on historical subjects. He is a member of the Explorers Club, where he has lectured on the Taino, Lost Civilizations of the Caribbean and the Guns of Columbus. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Brown. so many years of my life, including several living in that house that's within your direct view, the, uh, the Dunk on the Hump, uh, otherwise known as Beacon Rock, the home of Felix de Welda. Uh, that house has sometimes been called the finest single family residence in the United States of America. And it was 35 years ago, approximately, that I started my quest to write this book on the Iwo Jima monuments. And the reason the subtitle of the book is The Untold Story was that over in that building across uh, the water, I acquired Felix's uh, entire archive of thousands and thousands of photographs and documents and letters uh, detailing the construction, uh, not only of his Iwo Jima monuments, but many other sculptures. Uh, most people don't know it, but before Felix came to the United States and enlisted uh, voluntarily in the United States Navy, uh, he had already produced three coronation busts of three kings of England in a row. And of course, you had the abdication uh, in there that, that speeded it up, but he was also um, a noted artist by the time he uh, arrived um, and volunteered for the Navy. Here we are, 75 years ago, at one of the bloodiest battles in the Marine Corps history, the Battle of Iwo Jima. And here you see the uh, uh, first uh, wave of the invasion uh, going ashore there. You can see hundreds and hundreds of boats. And what you can most prominently see is this mountain, Mount Suribachi, that looks down right smack on the beachhead. And the Japanese forces were dug into that mountain with tunnels going straight through it uh, and out the other side where they had uh, movable gun emplacements and uh, absolutely wrecked havoc uh, on, the, on the, uh, the landing beach. Here we are with another view of the first wave uh, going in. And again, you can see how Mount Suribachi absolutely uh, dominates uh, the landing beach. Here's another shot of the landing beach, also known as Red Beach. And here you can see the many killed and wounded uh, Marines 
uh, suffering from the fire raining down upon them uh, from Mount Suribachi. And here we have the Marines climbing up over the escarpment uh, to get ashore uh, where they were even more exposed uh, to fire when they left the safety of the sand berm and got off the beach on, on the interior. And the bloody fighting went on uh, uh, for three days until on February 23rd, uh, the, the top brass decided that uh, we must raise a flag on Mount Suribachi. So they sent uh, the first gang up there, uh, and this is a photograph taken by Bill Janosko of the first flag raising. And uh, this was the one that got the most commotion because they promoted over the radio air traffic between the ships, and so all the ships honked their horns when they saw the flag go up and the troops on the ground were yelling and the Japanese were going nuts. But nevertheless, the top brass uh, felt that this flag was too small, so they ordered a second and larger flag uh, to be raised and a second uh, group to go up for the second flag raising. Now here is another uh, still picture, and it shows the first flag coming down simultaneously in the background as the second flag is going up. And uh, this is an important, uh, there's also a motion picture of this same scene of the simultaneous uh, raising of the second flag and the first flag coming down. And that's important for a reason that I'll get to in, a, in, in just a few minutes. Here is the second flag raising, probably the most, uh, definitely the most famous picture of World War II, and some say the most famous photograph ever taken in the history of the world. And uh, it was taken by photographer Joe Rosenthal, an uh, AP photographer, and Joe had set himself up a bunch of volcanic rocks to take the picture of the second flag raising. But the rocks gave out from under him, so he was falling backwards and about to land on his ass, and he grabbed the camera, and he pressed the shutter button, and he took a picture. But he didn't know that this was the picture that, that he was taking. It wasn't like having your iPhone today, where you can say, nah, I don't like that one, click it off, click, take another one. No Polaroids. Those canisters of film got all rolled up. They went back down to the beach, and once a day, a seaplane with pontoons uh, cruised up and landed on the beach at Iwo Jima, and they took all the orders and the photographers' films and everything, and they flew them back to Guam. And it was in Guam where the pictures were developed, and then the ones that they, they liked, they would send by radio telegraph back to the United States from Guam. So all this uh, took a couple of days, and when Joe Rosenthal uh, was started being congratulated for taking a great uh, picture, uh, he didn't know it was this picture. He had no idea it was that picture at all because after the second flag was raised, he gathered the troops that had raised the first flag as well as the troops that had raised the second flag and took what has become known as the gung-ho picture, which was posed. And so when they said to him, oh, did you pose the great picture that he took? This was the only picture he actually remembered taking because he had posed it, and he said, yeah, it was posed. Well, of course, the New York Times ran away with that, and uh, they, they said that this picture was posed, which it absolutely was not, and, and which is proven by the simultaneous pictures of one flag going down simultaneously while the other flag is, is going up. So, uh, going back, okay, so, now, this picture has become the most important picture uh, in World War II. It's flashed all over the media, uh, on the front page of uh, newspapers. Uh, within 24 hours after the, phone, uh, the photograph was uh, uh, taken due to the, uh, the wireless at that time. And so everyone knew that it was important. So it was going to be an important photograph one way or another for the war effort. So, uh, back in the United States, at the Anacosta Naval Air Station outside of Washington, D.C., they needed a place outside of the busy electricity of, of the city to receive wireless communications from the war zones, uh, and Anacosta was it. And that was where Felix Duellman was working as a, a painter for uh, naval aviation. And so here he is. This is a wartime picture of him taken in his uh, uniform. Uh, with his uh, insignia there, 
and he immediately understood the importance of the photograph as a patriotic uh, and important image. And he had a weekend leave scheduled uh, to be with his uh, soon-to-be wife, uh, Margot, but he canceled the weekend leave on himself and he stayed on base uh, to create a wax model of the photograph and sculpture. And so we call this the weekend wax. And here is the, the weekend wax. Uh, this is Ted Gamble, a Treasury Department fundraising official. Here is Felix de Weldon. And on the right we have John Bradley, the Navy Corpsman. Uh, right here we have Rene Gagnon. Um, no, Rene Gagnon is here, and this is Ira Hayes, uh, the Pima Indian. And so uh, Felix um, took the weekend wax and he cast that into a cement uh, plaster statue uh, using this as the, the mold for it. Uh, with the wire skeleton uh, reinforcing it. And here is the uh, cement plaster uh, version of the weekend wax. And here we are in the Oval Office. And you can see here we have President Truman on the left, Felix de Weldon standing next to Truman. And next to Felix is Joe Wilsonthal, the AP photographer that took the picture. So here you have in this one picture, you have the sculptor who made the statue and the photographer uh, that took the original picture. But Felix knew, okay, he had only been in the, the, the service a short period of time, but he knew when he was ordered to take this statue to the White House, and I have a copy of those original orders in my archive, the original order for him to produce it and take it over to the White House on June 6th at 12 noon, and he knew that he, he was never going to see that again. He knew they would take it away from him. So guess what he did? He made a couple more. <laughs> and here is one of those uh, other copies, which I'm proud to have in my collection. And that, um, that one is four feet by four feet, not counting the flag, which brings it up to uh, uh, eight feet. Now, it was immediately decided that this image was so important that it was going to be the focus of the seventh war bond drive, uh, which paid off half the war debt of World War II. Think about it. You have the poster images, the photographs, uh, the sculptures, the monuments, and that seventh war bond drive, which featured the Iwo Jima flag raising, paid off half the war debt of World War II. And this was important because at the end of World War II, the United States was flat broke. And when we needed to gas up the battleship Missouri, the Arabs didn't say, give us $750,000. They said, give us 750 bars of gold. Because in World War II, the United States dollar was not an internationally recognized currency. The Arabs would not take it in payment uh, for oil. All they wanted is gold. So these fundraising drives uh, to collect uh, hard money you know, to sponsor the war drives was extremely important. And so the, the sculpture was um, scaled up into be a, to be a 10 ton monument. Uh, and all this was taking place in the summer of 1945, while the war was still going on, while we were firebombing Japan, while the Battle of Okinawa was taking place, while the Battle of Berlin were taking place. This was being made into a 10 ton model. And one of the most important and actually recent discoveries uh, that I made uh, that came out of the DeWeldon archives was that DeWeldon had the help of six Marines that were lent to him by the Marine Corps to help build the monument. Um, and they did the hard work of making the steel skeleton and hammer welding the steel rebar and carrying around the tons of cement and plaster that were used to wrap around the steel skeleton and, and make the statue. And it was damn hot uh, work in the summer of 1945 um, inside of DeWeldon's uh, sculpture studio. I have a service, as a military historian, I have a service that does uh, look up for me the name and uh, uh, service record of anybody I give them the name to. They look up the name of the service record. And so I hired my service to look up these six guys who I now call the Monument Men, and Dan, if it didn't turn out that all of them were in the 3rd Marine Division, all of them had fought on Guadalcanal 
Bougainville, Guam, and Iwo Jima. So here we have six Marines that had just a few weeks ago been fighting on Iwo Jima that were now helping build the original Iwo Jima monument. It really turns the monument into much more than a sacred uh, um, uh, object than it already is. And by the way, half of those Marines uh, uh, won the Purple Heart for being wounded in action. And here are the men, the monument men. This guy is my favorite, Les Gadger. He's, he's my favorite because he's the only one of them that's still alive. He's my good friend. Um, and the family sent me all of their World War II archival photos. I talk to him uh, regularly. The lower left picture, uh, that's uh, Les with a fighting knife in his teeth carrying a Tommy gun. He was a machine gunner. And then the picture on the lower right is of uh, him carrying his heavy machine gun during the Battle of, uh, of Guam. And here's the crew together. Uh, that may or may not be my model that's uh, in, in the middle of them there, but they were all gathered around uh, the entranceway of Felix's uh, studio. Uh, he acquired, uh, uh, first by renting it, the original sculptor studio of Paul Bartlett that did the freeze for the Capitol building. And uh, that's where the first and also the gigantic bronze zoo that's in Arlington today, they were all built uh, right here in, in this building. And here is a picture of them posing as the flag raisers themselves, because they did the modeling for Felix to help in the sculpting. And here is the, uh, the, the first monument that's about halfway through uh, construction in the sculpture's studio there. You can see Felix on the left. And in the photograph that's on the right, uh, you see um, uh, Ira Hayes and Rene Gagnon, two of the flag raisers, they came over to the studio quite often to help uh, Felix pose for their own likenesses in the monuments. And this is the unveiling of the Iwo Jima monument on the birthday of the Marine Corps, November 10, 1945. And you notice down in the lower left-hand corner, those are sound recording devices. They made a wire recording of the ceremony for the unveiling of this monument and the surviving flag raisers spoke there. It was a, it's a very, very moving ceremony. And I got from Felix uh, the transcription platters that these wire recordings were translated into. They're about this big. You can't play them on any record player uh, known today. It took me years to find a laboratory that could clean them up and then digitize them so that I could hear the ceremony uh, again. And those are available over here on the table along with the, with the books, uh, sound recordings of that original ceremony. And next we have the, the setting uh, of the first Iwo Jima monument. Again, this is in 1945. The building in the background is the old Navy Department building on Constitution Avenue. Today it's the home of the Treasury Department, but back then it was the Navy Department. And here's a fabulous close-up of the original monument. It's uh, beyond belief. It's, uh, it stood there for a couple of years. A million people a year uh, came to see it. They had photography contests to photograph it, the whole nine yards. And then suddenly Felix got the announcement from the Parks Department that they were going to build the uh, Pan American Union building on the spot uh, where his monument was standing. Uh, and he had to take it home and get rid of it. And the reason it was his to take home was that the government had never paid for it. The government was broke. He built that monument out of his own expense. He took out a GI loan on the GI Bill, and instead of using the money for education, he used it for renting the Paul Bartlett studio and buying the tons of steel rebar and cement to make the original monument. So that monument, um, went back to Randolph Street, the sculpture studio, then he took it out to Quantico and set it up beside a gigantic block of marble, and with calipers they were able to translate this and make a duplicate of the statue, which still stands today at the entrance of the Marine Corps base in Quantico, uh, Virginia. And after that was done, then this went back into a studio, 
where it was basically lost and forgotten until for about a half a century until I come along writing this book and saying, where is the statue? I don't remember seeing it anywhere. And he, he said, well, it's got to be, I don't remember uh, doing anything with it. It's probably, you know, it's not in the, the studio because I've been in there and I knew it wasn't inside. Uh, so I went back down there and found it wrapped up in a tarpaulin. Some trees had fallen on it from some storms, uh, but it was still intact. So I made a deal with Felix to buy the statue, and part two of the deal was that I would have it restored and re-unveiled on the 50-year anniversary uh, of the Battle of Iwo Jima. And so here we are, unwrapping the thing outside of his uh, studio, um, cutting it off of the old base so we could make it into a five-ton statue instead of a ten-ton statue with the, with the base, and then lifting it out and loading it up onto a flatbed truck where, it, where we, we took it up to Sculpture House in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, where we built a little uh, shed around it. And for five years, uh, uh, a lot of money, a house and a divorce later, I finally got <laughs> uh, restored and re-unveiled, uh, true to my word, on the 50-year anniversary uh, on the Intrepid Sea Air Space Museum in, in New York City. And it was the heart and soul and the center um, of a Battle of the Iwo Jima um, exhibition that I had lent them. And then it was, it was there for about 13 years, and then they decided they wanted to do a gut renovation of the entire interior of the ship and get everything off the ship. So like the Parks Department told Felix de Weldon when they built the Pan American Union, I got the word, Rodney, get it out of there. So. Here we are, crating the thing up. The guys look like they're almost in prison, don't they? <clears throat> Here's a barge crane moving it off of the ship. And you can see the tilt of the box there. I took this picture. When I saw that, I thought there was like a 50-50 chance they were going to dump the thing in the Hudson River. But fortunately, it got down onto a, a flatbed truck, safe and sound, all aboard and into an arts, created up and into an art storage uh, uh, warehouse. And about five years ago, uh, I brought it out of the warehouse again for a show and tell at the sculpture garden outside of Bonhams in New York City at 57th Street and Madison Avenue. And they're my boys, they're looking, uh, looking pretty good. And then after that, we go back into the warehouse. Kind of looks like that last scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark, where they have the ark packaged up in a crate that looks pretty similar to that, and it's going down the, the hallway of this warehouse. Um, and it's still in that warehouse today. It's sitting there doing nobody any good. It's a, a little uh, too big for my living room, and uh, so it's looking for a forever, forever home. That's for sure. It's it's it should be somewhere where people can enjoy it because everywhere it has been, a million people here have come to see it. And now we go back in time uh, to the late 40s when the absence of the original 1945 monument led to a drive to build a big, big, big replacement of the Iwo Jima monument, which eventually became uh, the bronze, uh, which is in Arlington today, known as the Marine Corps War Memorial. And so here's the sculpting um, for, for that. Here is Ira Hayes posing for himself. Ira is the last figure in the flag raising group right there. And here he is posing. He's the guy whose two, whose two hands are, uh, are up like that. Here is Felix sculpting a maquette of the new design. And you notice the new design differs from the 1945 design in that the flag planter guy is drawn into the flag raiser group to make a more unified figure uh, to show more unity of, of, of purpose, uh, etc. Here's another model of that second design. This is the construction of the gigantic plaster mold um, 
that was used to build the, the bronze. And you can see the thing is gradually being winched up into the rafters of the studio, uh, and it's being built from the top down with uh, these blocks filling in block by block as it goes up and up and up until it's finally reached as far as it can go. And here's a picture of Felix doing some finishing touches up in the rafters. And once built, that giant <coughs> plaster model was cut up into six, 106 pieces to be cast in bronze to assemble the Marine Corps Memorial that's in Arlington today. And Felix chose for that job uh, Beattie Brassi, now Beattie Mackey Art Foundry in Brooklyn, New York. And they are still in business today. This picture was taken by myself a year before last when I visited the foundry, and they're still, they're still casting bronze, still doing the same work. And what's also amazing was the same tools that were used to build the bronze Iwo Jima Memorial in 1950 are still on the, hanging on the same nails on the same brick walls as they were <laughs> 50, 60, 70 years ago. Everything's the same. Absolutely nothing has changed. And I compared the photographs just to, uh, uh, to make absolutely sure. And one, once uh, the 106 pieces were cast, they were bolted together into four master groups. In other words, you didn't take all 106 pieces down to Arlington, Virginia, and just start screwing them together. They were bolted together in these master figures. And when they took the truck convoy across the George Washington Bridge here, the George Washington Bridge sank down four inches <laughs> from that thing went across. And here they are assembling the master sections suspended in midair. Now the reason for that is that you started with a, the front left toe of the first figure and screwed every bolted everything together. By the time you got over to the last figure, everything would be four inches off, okay? But by assembling it with no stress from, from the platform, in midair, they were able to screw everything together so all the pieces fit. And then once the statue was assembled, hanging in midair, then it was lowered down onto the platform. This is astounding. This was the largest bronze sculpture ever built at the time it was built in the history of the world. No one had ever done this before. So Felix de Welden was not only an incredible genius as an artist and a sculptor, as a construction engineer, he was an equally great uh, 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 genius because he had to figure out which pieces go where in order to make the master figures to consolidate uh, with it. So he's a, he's a genius as a construction engineer. No one has ever known about that. I found out in all of my paperwork, he actually uh, GC'd uh, the job of building the, the bronze monument himself. He was the general contractor. That means he had his financial tail feathers on the line. And from when he got the job and when it was done, to build that, cast it in bronze, assemble it, and have it ready for the ceremony in nine months flat is a miracle that could never be accomplished uh, today. Plus, they did it for $850,000. How many billion do you think it would cost <laughs> if you were to try to duplicate that today? I wouldn't even want to guess. And as I was uh, saying before, the sculpture pieces had to be bolted together from the inside. You couldn't have the flanges on the outside, that would look terrible. So they had to be bolted on the, together on the inside. So it was a, obviously the assembly was an inside job. Here is Mr. Beatty from the Beatty uh, foundry uh, tightening those bolts uh, from the inside. And uh, Phillies convinced the entire crew up at the Beatty Rossi foundry to come to Washington and work with his crew from his sculpture studio down there, and those are the two crews that actually assembled the Iwo Jima monument uh, on the spot. Now, I know you're wondering, how is the last going to get out? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, there is a trap door, the secret trap door, in the Iwo Jima monument. I am not sure, I may be the only one in the world that knows where it is, uh, but I can assure you there are no bodies uh, uh, left inside. And here is the finished product, which we all know and love. I mean, what 
an incredible job. Now, I tell you these two pictures of the 1945 monument and the Marine Corps Memorial side by side to illustrate the difference in the design. On the left, you have the 1945 monument with that large space between the flag planter guy and the five flag raiser guys. That is exactly as it happened on Mount Suribachi. That's exactly how it is in General Rosenthal's photograph. It's the new and improved design of drawing that first figure into the others that shows up in the later models. Now, most people don't know the real reason for the Battle of Iwo Jima. What you're taught, if you're taught it at all, in the history books or in school, is that Iwo Jima had two airstrips on an island that was halfway between Tinian Island, which is where our big uh, B-29 bomber base was, and that uh, all the planes took off to, to bomb Japan, including the atomic bombers. And so a lot of them ran out of fuel. Uh, some of them had an engine shot out or, or, or failure. These planes on those missions, these Boeings, had a 20% operational failure rate. So there, there was a definite need to, to have some interim place where they could uh, uh, crash land or safe land or something like that. Uh, there's no question uh, about it. I'm happy to see that Boeing has improved on its failure rate as the decades have gone by, but they had to rush that plane into combat. We absolutely positively needed a long range, high altitude, heavy bomber, and we didn't have it. So they rushed those things out, even though the oxygen mass didn't work and all kinds of stuff went wrong, but we had to have it. But everything about that is, is true. We did need those two airfields, but strategically, they were weighing the cost of about five to possibly 6,000 Army Air Force uh, crew getting uh, wet in the Pacific, and dunking, dunking into the Pacific Ocean. And, but you weigh that against the cost of 28,000 Marines killed and wounded on Iwo Jima, hey, that doesn't make it, okay? The real reason, and no one who fought on Iwo Jima knew this, and no, none, neither, none of the commanders of the people that fought on Iwo Jima knew this, but we were planning the atomic bomb. And the real reason we needed Iwo Jima was that in case there was a failure on one of these uh, Boeing bombers that was carrying an atomic bomb, we didn't want one of those planes to fall into the hands of the Japanese. Because we knew that, like the Germans, the Japanese were also working on an atomic bomb program. We knew the Japanese were manufacturing heavy water in a, for producing uranium in a plant in uh, uh, what is now North Korea. So we knew that if the Japanese got a hold of one of these planes and the bomb, they would be very quickly able to re-engineer it. And that was the real reason why Iwo Jima was a battle that absolutely, positively had to happen. And not without great cost. This is the 5th Marine Division Secretary on Iwo Jima. There's two more just, uh, there were two more just like it, one for the 3rd Division and one for the 4th Division. And uh, eventually after the war, all of these uh, bodies were brought back to the United States. And three of the uh, so-called flag raisers are buried in Arlington National Cemetery as well as many other Marines that fall on Iwo Jima, which is fitting because Arlington National Cemetery uh, abuts the Bronze Marine Corps Memorial Monument. Now, a, a cultural phenomenon has been taking place over the last 50 years, and people have been gathering together and building Iwo Jima monuments all over the country. It's a cultural phenomenon. You don't find this with people building statues of liberty in uh, Minnesota or California or Texas or anything like that. It's only Iwo Jima monuments. And so these are all the states uh, in red, including Hawaii uh, down there, that have uh, uh, one or more Iwo Jima monuments. This is uh, 
uh, that <coughs> marble one that I was talking about earlier at the gates of the Marine Corps base entrance in Quantico, uh, Virginia. This is old Glory herself there, also in Virginia. This is another copy of the 1945 monument, uh, which is at the parade ground of the Marine Corps base in Paris Island, South Carolina. This one, this is a magnificent example at the Naval War College Museum, uh, not too far away. And it's absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. It's beautifully displayed on a high plinth. And I highly recommend you going over and, and taking a look at it. It's uh, fantastic. And there's a, another bronze that's in uh, Connecticut. California, we got three plus one in the planning stages at Fort Pendleton down on the lower left. I don't know whether that ever happened, but uh, it's been in the planning stages for years and years and years. Here we go with Massachusetts. This one's right up in Fall River. It's right up the river from uh, Battleship Cove. So this is close by for you to uh, take a look at. And that's a, that, that's a, this is a beauty. Florida has two. Iowa, the welcome home soldier. Minnesota, Texas. Now, this one in Texas, this is actually that cement plaster original model for the Marine Corps Bronze Memorial in Arlington, where the 106 pieces have been reassembled and then rebronzed. And this graces the parade ground of the Marine Military Academy in Arlington, Texas. And as you can see, they take beautiful care of it. Pennsylvania, Hawaii, this is the punch bowl cemetery in, uh, in Hawaii. God bless our flag, and this is the flag of the second flag raising on Iwo Jima. And now we're gonna do a short seven minute film clip before we come back to the last slide and the question and answers. <coughs>
to the memory of men who have died for our country, and that we may rededicate our lives to the ideals and principles of our country and its freedoms, and consecrate our lives to its service, and to thee, our Lord. Amen. For this statue, De Weldon was able to use living one. Three of the men who had actually raised the flag, the others had given their lives for their country. This stone memorial stands at the entrance of the Marine Corps base of Quantico, Virginia. This was a great achievement, but De Weldon was not satisfied. Carefully, he measured his mark. Inspired, he sought to give it a sweeping magnitude. He envisioned a monument which would preserve and encompass the spirit, thrill the heart of the nation. He visualized a gigantic memorial which would rise to majestic heights commemorating forever the unsurpassed gallantry of the Marine and the Navy Corpsman who raised the flag. It would be the spirit of all Marines from Tripoli and Chapultepec, from Bellow Woods, and back across the Pacific from Wake Island to Japan. A memorial to the heroic gallantry of all our fighting men. One to leave no doubt in the minds of our enemies that we are determined to keep our freedom. Here was a challenge. As the years passed, this towering memorial took on form and expression. The feel, the drive, the thrust and power of the smaller statue was achieved in one 64 times greater. Challenge was met. Now the heroic group was finished. Molded in plaster, it was ready to be cast in bronze. Authorized by the unanimous vote of Congress, this memorial was made possible by donations of the people, by former Marines, the fathers and mothers of our fallen comrades, friends of the Corps, and men of the Navy and Marine Corps themselves. It would be the spirit of all the people of the United States, a symbol of all America for all time. Second class, John Bradley, USN. USMC. Sergeant Michael Strength, USMC. Private first class, Franklin Sousley, USMC. Corporal Harlan Block, USMC. An original American, a Pima Indian from the broad plains of Arizona, a student from the dairy lands of Wisconsin, a mill worker from the hills of New Hampshire, a son of Czechoslovakian immigrants, a professional Marine from the Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania, a war worker from the fertile tobacco lands of Kentucky, and a truck driver from the rich oil fields of southern Texas. The oldest was 25, the youngest 19. Five were Marines, one a sailor. The great moment lives, an eternal shrine to valor. In this memorial lives again the courageous spirit which makes America great. In it is the relentless determination of the American people to defend democracy against those who would destroy it. This inspired monument is a tribute to the indomitable courage of our fighting men and a manifestation of their faith in America. 
This really happened. One of the most dramatic incidents of any war. Bribery. Perpetuated in bronze in our nation's capital. Enduring for posterity. This is you. And you. And you. Silent, yet it will speak. Speak a universal tongue. Of the past, the present, and for the future. The symbol of a great nation. The symbol of a great people. Uncommon valor, but common virtue. They're in storage. Yeah, they're in the storage now. For safekeeping, because we had to remove them because they were doing construction on that walkway, so they had to get we had to get them out of there. So. Yeah. So hopefully they'll they'll be out again sometime soon. Yep. Did, did Epley own the property? What? Mary and Epley. Is he the one who gave the property to to Weldon? I don't know exactly which area it was. The painter's made second class, and then he became a painter's made uh, first class. Painters? So he thought, he thought that they were going to have him painting the underside of battleships when he got that news. <laughs> Fortunately, his job at Anacostia was painting whale portraits of admirals and doing big mural uh, sea battle scenes for that would be used to go behind the bar at an officer's club. But uh, he grew up in Vienna where he won sculpture contests at a very early age. Uh, he helped one uh, uh, Jewish refugee escape the Nazis there by having a, uh, making a sculpture bus out of him, but then casting it in solid gold. The guy sold everything he had, was solid gold. Felix did this thing in gold and then painted it in bronze. And uh, the uh, the border guard said, "Yeah, we get you and your ugly sculpture out of here." <laughs> and then they actually uh, got it out, but. Uh, he was renowned, as I said before, he did sculpture busts of Three Kings of England and also 
uh, Prime Minister Mackenzie King of uh, Canada uh, right before the war began. And he ended up doing over 1,200 major sculptures all over the world. He's the only sculptor that has a monument on every continent uh, wow. in, in the Earth. North Pole, South Pole. Okay. Well, his, uh, his rate, uh, I never saw any rate like that. It, uh, what was shown to him, what he was uh, rate, uh, and what his job was. Yeah. Well, he, he, and it looks like uh, he was the only sculptor in the outfit. That's, that's what they gave him. Yeah, I, I never saw that in Sydney. Well, it's not a common insignia, but it's right out of the book. <clears throat> what happened to him in later years? He used to live around here for a while. He was somewhat of a character. Um, did, did he die here in Newport? Or? No. Um, he fell into, in the 1980s, uh, basically he went broke. And he had mortgaged uh, uh, the hell out of Beacon Rock uh, so that he couldn't pay his uh, mortgage. And so that was the time when I was living there with him. And I used to take him out to um, lunch every Sunday at, at Castle Rock. So uh, one day he hands me an envelope over at lunch and he says, Rodney, uh, you're down on Wall Street. Would you like to become my financial advisor? And I said, sure, I'd be, be honored to do that. I, I, probably, I was thinking to myself, he's got probably got a lot of treasuries and he doesn't know whether to go long or short. Um, and so anyway, I said yes. So he hands me the envelope, I open the envelope, and it's a foreclosure notice from the bank <laughs> foreclosing on Beacon Rock. Now obviously this is a this is a thing where I gotta help out because I'm living there with <laughs> writing the book. I'm living there with him. So um, I eventually got him three offers of mortgages. So here back then, he was like an 80, 85 years old, something like that. Uh, like getting an 85-year-old guy, 30-year mortgages, three 30-year mortgages, and I couldn't take down any one of the deals. You know why? Because he hadn't filed tax returns and he couldn't produce tax returns. And the reason he didn't file tax returns is that he gotten into some other trouble uh, that made it uh, impossible for him to file the tax returns. So uh, what happened then is eventually uh, he got uh, booted uh, out by the court and there was a bankruptcy sale uh, of Beacon Rock uh, and that went on for years and years and years because the winning bidder uh, didn't pay and then sued and then eventually they worked out a deal uh, and, and so forth. And, um, so he then went out west and lived out west uh, uh, for a while and passed away peacefully and he's uh, buried in Arlington National Cemetery within sight of his monument. Up until even recently, there were various uh, press pieces regarding the controversy surrounding the actual six uh, fellows who had, who had put up the flag. And Names have been put on and then taken off, and I noticed that Rene Gagnon's was, was one of them that had recently. Is, is that because there were two different flag raisings and, and people were confused? No. Um, I'm trying to get my slides because I've been waiting for your question. Um, <laughs> Jessica, can you help get the slideshow? <laughs> That's correct. You don't see the faces of the men. All of the men were turned away from the camera when the photograph was taken. Now, you couple that with the fact that when this event took place, nobody knew that that picture was being taken, not even the guy who took it while he was falling over backwards. So nobody knew that they were doing anything that would later be deemed historically significant. And so, when the photograph was developed and it was uh, immediately 
uh, President Truman said, find out who the three survivors are and get them back here as fast as you can. We need them for fundraising for the Seventh War Bond Drive. Uh, uh, they had to identify these three guys. And nobody back then wanted to be one of those three guys. The, the kids that fought on Iwo Jima weren't like uh, people today. Those guys didn't want to go home. They wanted to stay right there fighting with their buddies. They didn't want to go back and, and, and be goddamn heroes in the United States of America. And when they decided that uh, uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps decided that Rene Gagnon was their key guy uh, that was first identified as a flag raiser, he protested and says, no, I'm not. And he said, well, it's already in the New York Times. You are one of the flag raisers now. And then to compound things uh, and make them worse, they relied upon Gagnon to identify the other two surviving flag raisers. So it turns out, now that Howard Pye Keller has taken the place of Rene Gagnon as the final uh, edit in who the flag raisers actually were, the guy they were relying on, he wasn't even part of the flag raising at all. He was part of the first flag raising. So what happened was, after they had decided that Gagnon had to rat out the other two, there was a huge fight. Uh, um, Ira Hayes, the Pima Indian, threatened to kill Gagnon if Gagnon ratted him out as one of the flag raisers because he did not want to go back to the US and, and go on a drinking tour or a bomb raising tour or something like that. Those guys all wanted to stay right where they are. And, and so the Marine Corps, basically, they never had a chance of getting this thing right because A, it wasn't known that it was a famous event when it took place. B, the guys that were in the event didn't want to be heroes. They wanted to stay right there with their buddies uh, and keep fighting. And uh, so even Pi Keller, the last one that was identified that uh, replaced Gagnon, he lived his whole life and never even told his wife or his children that he was one of the flag raisers. That's, that's the way they were. Thank you very much. <laughs>